can't really capture uh, what is going on in the book of Acts and the passage we have read. Um, it is a glorious passage, but before we start, let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, for your word, that it is living and active today, that it speaks uh, to our situation and into our lives. And Lord, give us attentive minds, soft hearts and open ears to be able to receive your word and change us by your spirit. Encourage us, challenge us and change us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, after all this time, energy, effort, resources, uh, finances, fundraising, all the work, the praying, the planning that has gone into this new church plant over many years, um, you know, we've moved in uh, to the area in January. We were getting to know our neighbourhood. We were gathering a core team. We were gaining momentum. And then, bang, the global pandemic that we heard on the news and on the radio hit our doorsteps. The Prime Minister said, you're grounded. Social distancing enforced. Our diaries stripped and our plans scrapped. And uh, we've been persevering virtually in the last month, uh, persisting in prayer, planning in the background and uh, preparing for the uncertainties to come as we look in God's strength to uh, plant a new church in this area. But why church planting? And just think about it for a moment. Uh, Onestead still needs to hear the gospel. You know, we could just join your church. I'm sure you'd be grateful for another family. It'd be a good thing uh, to support the work of Grace Church Wanstead, to go out and reach out there. But why persevere and persist here in this area uh, for this new church plant. Well, I'm, I understand and I'm aware that I'm speaking to the converted. Uh, Grace Church Wanstead, you've been going on for 14 years now. Uh, you guys get it, you understand church planting. Uh, you don't need convincing that it's a good thing, but you need reminding from God's word that, that it's a good thing to do. And the book of Acts will show us why and remind us that it's good. Uh, so this uh, two-week uh, uh, series in Acts, it's not an exposition uh, per se as you're used to. But what we're going to do is just take the thread of church planting and trace it through the book. And so we're going to get some big picture stuff uh, today before we zoom into the passage we have read and we'll continue next week. And we're going to look at the why and the how of church planting this week and then the priorities next week. So firstly, why church planting? We're gonna start by zooming out to get really the big picture of what God is doing in the book of Acts. And there are three words that tell us why. Biblical, missional, and strategic. Firstly, because it's missional, because Jesus tells us to. Now, Acts is Luke's uh, second volume. I understand you've been doing Luke on Sundays. Uh, and it begins with Jesus' ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And Jesus says in Acts 1 verse 8, But you, that is the early apostles and disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So the spread of God's word, it required the early Christians at the time to testify to the good news of Jesus, to be witnesses. And Acts, Acts chapters 1 and 2 describe how the early church in Jerusalem was born in prayer, bathed in the Spirit, and began with the proclamation of God's word. And the result of that wasn't isolated believers that were scattered, but communities of believers who were gathered. So in 2 verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And you're very familiar with this. This is the activity of church. This is doing church. We're doing it virtually now. 
uh, but last month and uh, last year you were doing it face to face in person gathered as a community in Wanstead ever since you first planted in 2006. But Grace Church Wanstead will find their roots go beyond go further back than 2006. Their roots are biblical. They stem from the early church in Jerusalem. Because the first disciples obeyed God's word, were bold witnesses, and they spread the good news of Jesus. Why church planting? Well, it's biblical. Jesus tells them, told them, and he tells us to do it. But secondly, because it's missional. It is the way people are saved, even in the midst of opposition, persecution, uncertainty, and the unlikely circumstances and people that God uses. Just think about it for a moment. The church in Jerusalem, they could have just remained in Jerusalem. And they could have said, look, we're too small. Uh, the church, is, the, the task is way too big too many pastoral issues and if if we go out into judea and samaria and the rest of the earth it will result in too much persecution too much opposition but they didn't see they continued to be obedient witnesses and what happened well god's word spread even though they were small and the task was big even though it did cost them even though it resulted in much opposition and persecution it spread. And what I want to show you is this. When we feel small, ordinary, inadequate for God's big mission, when we know that it will involve sacrifice, when we know it will hurt and will be opposed, those are the very means that God uses to grow his kingdom. The most unlikely of circumstances and the most unlikely of people. And this is really, really, I found this very encouraging. So even though Peter and John were imprisoned in Acts 4 and the apostles were imprisoned in Acts 5, chapter 6, verse 7 says this. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Churches in Jerusalem were planted despite imprisonment. And then in Acts 7, despite Stephen's martyrdom, his death, well, it served as a catalyst for mission. See, a great persecution broke out. And what did that cause? Well, it caused the disciples to be scattered all through Judea and Samaria. And what did they do? Well, they continued speaking God's word. And that sped up rather than slowed down uh, the spread of God's word. So 9 verse 31, then the church throughout Judea Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord, not man, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers, not decreased. So the scattered disciples, <clears throat> they started Jewish churches in Judea and Samaria and the founding of the great Jew Gentile church, which we heard in our song in Acts 11. Despite Paul trying to snuff out the church, he was miraculously converted in Acts 9. He was transformed from persecuting Christians to proclaiming Christ to the Gentiles. And 12 verse 24, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Acts 12, despite James's death and uh, Peter's imprisonment, we had read this morning, Acts 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. And in the song, despite Paul's persecutions, Acts 13 to 19, stoning, beating, plots, conspiracy, mockery, Jewish resistance in Gentile areas, being driven out of synagogues, 19, verse 20. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Churches were founded in Judea, in Samaria, and Paul planted in Gentile regions, in Philippi, in Corinth, in Ephesus. 
And that is why this series is called Mission Unstoppable. Smallness, weakness, inadequacy, opposition, persecution, the most unlikely of situations and the most unlikely of people. Those are the means that God uses to grow his kingdom. Friends, be encouraged by that. We live in uncertain times now. We don't know when we'll be allowed to meet again uh, in person or what state the economy will be. There are many uncertainties that lie ahead, but we know this. God's word was unstoppable because God was on a mission and nothing's changed. God's word is unstoppable even today because he's on mission today. And he uses the most unlikely circumstances. So this pandemic, not as an obstacle, but an opportunity. Not to slow down, but to speed up. It's not come as a surprise to him. He's got it in hand. He's in control. So be, be encouraged. Why church planting? Well, it's missional. Even despite all the opposition and the persecution, unbelievers were saved for God's kingdom. You've seen it in Acts. And God's kingdom grew. And God is working today. Isn't that why many of you joined Grace Church Wanstead in the first place? Because you wanted to see unbelievers in Wanstead saved. See, as one of our partner founding churches, what a joy it is to know that yourselves, where you are, as you partner with us in prayer, in support, that you're part of God's work here on the other side of the M11 and the A12, in Clayville and Barkingside, giving people the opportunity to hear the gospel. And yet, yeah, it will come as a cost. Uh, we've seen that in Acts. It will cost time and energy and resources, talents, finances, hard work. Perhaps um, losing gifted and godly people uh, in your church. It will be a thankless task. It will come with persecution and suffering and opposition. And we will start out small. We have started out small. Uh, we feel inadequate for the big task ahead. But we need to remember that it is in these times, God is on mission. His word is unstoppable. And he will use us and the most unlikely of circumstances to grow his kingdom. This pandemic may appear to be a threat to the church. But remember, in, in those times, and even now, it is these very things that cause the church to grow. So let's make it our prayer that God would use these times to grow his church and that people would hear of him. Why church planting? It's biblical, it's missional. Thirdly, it's strategic. It is the most effective way to reach non-Christians and new communities with the gospel. Now, one should say, well, why not just employ an evangelist uh, at Grace Church Wanstead? Uh, he could sort of travel up, you know, it's only 10, 15 minutes, tell people about Jesus here. They become Christians and bingo, you just keep doing that. That's uh, cost effective, less sacrifices. But uh, I think we know the reality of mission and evangelism. We've seen it from Acts. It comes at a cost. But we also know from our experiences personally that, you know, it's slow. And it's hard work. It takes time to build relationships before people are in a position to hear the gospel. And then there's the question, well, what about discipleship after people come to faith? Planting churches is the most effective way uh, to reach people. And uh, here's what, just a few reasons just from Acts that I'm going to share with you. See, firstly, Paul went from city to city in order to plant churches. So 16 verse 12. From there, we travel to Philippi a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. It's strategic because cities like Philippi and London are where you find people and lots of people and people from all nations. See, Esther's parents helped us to move here in January. They're from a, a village uh, somewhere <coughs> in the country uh, up north and uh, they could not believe that 25,000 people are packed 
per square mile of London and where we were. But that's great. That's great for the gospel. And it's strategic, isn't it? It's strategic because we now live and work in the area. You'll know from Max, Paul lived and worked amongst the people there. And we've been getting to know people in our neighbourhood and our community. It's a bit harder now. Um, but that's what we're hoping to do once the lockdown is lifted. It's strategic because new churches have no traditions. You'll know this when you first started 14 years ago. So uh, this area has changed quite a lot. It used to be uh, very Jewish. It's now become quite mixed, uh, quite a, a rise in Asian people here. So we've got a blank sheet of paper. If you had to design a church from scratch and work out how we best going to serve this neighbourhood and reach them for Christ, well, we can do that because we've got no traditions. It's, um, it's strategic because new churches can intentionally think about the lost and unbelievers. See, someone asked me uh, a couple of months ago, they, they said, Rick, aren't you daunted with such a small team and such a big task? And uh, I smiled and said back, well, I've got less pastoral issues to think about. It's true. So I can dedicate most of my time to thinking about the unchurched and unbelievers. It's strategic because church planting offers more than just evangelism, but discipleship and training. See, the church in Antioch became a hub for discipleship, training and multiplication. Paul and Barnabas were sent out from the church in Antioch in Acts 13 verse 3. And the pattern was repeated in Philippi when Epaphroditus was sent out. Church planting means that in addition to unbelievers hearing the gospel, Mature believers can be trained, but also new believers can be discipled. And it's strategic because new churches strengthen existing churches. So when I spoke to uh, David, your pastor, uh, he said that a lot of you have been really encouraged and it's given a new impetus for what you could be doing in Wanstead as you hear about God at work here in Barkingside and Cable. Why church planting? Well, it's biblical, it's missional, and it's strategic. So here's the question for you to ponder. Are you convinced that church planting is good for God's kingdom? Well, I'm convinced that, and that's why I've moved my family here. We've been tasked with tens of thousands of people to reach. We've got a small team. The task is overwhelmingly big. So the question now becomes, well, how do we do it? How do we church plant? Now we're going to zoom in to the passage uh, on the ground with Paul and Silas and Timothy and just learn uh, a few lessons uh, of how they did it and then apply those principles. And there are lots of principles uh, we can have, um, but I think there are five key principles uh, from this passage uh, that we can learn. Firstly, Elder Let, 14 verse 23. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in the church. So in, the fir in their first missionary journey, after founding the, the Jew Gentile church <clears throat> and founding the first few churches, Paul and Barnabas intentionally appointed elders so that they could put some order in those new churches and help them to grow and thrive. They saw that in order for churches to grow and thrive, they needed elders. So if we're going to establish this new church and, you know, we want it to be healthy, we want it to grow, we need elders. And not just one, but we need a leadership team. Um, and that's why I'm delighted that Simon Percy is joining us as an elder. He knows the area. He's older, he's wiser, our gifts complement one another, and we'll hold each other account in decisions. But that's why you have multiple elders at Grace Church Wanstead, to help you guys to grow and to thrive. So why should it be any different for a new church plant? A healthy church starts with elders. But secondly, prayer dependent. See, peppered all through the book of Acts, you'll find that 
the disciples and the early apostles, they depended on prayer. I know you've been looking at the book of Philippians uh, recently in your groups. How much do we see how much Paul depended on prayer? And in his letters as well. When Paul and Silas were thrown into prison unjustly for helping the slave girl, what did they do? Well, they prayed. And I found this a huge challenge to my own prayer life. See, I'm convinced that I need to pray more. And if we're to expect any growth or fruit from this church plant or the ministries that we do, we need to pray because we're dependent on God. And just an example of this, you know, the Passion for Life churches of which you're a part of, um, they've been praying for, well, a number of years for a worker to be raised up to be able to take the gospel out to this new area and establish a new church. And as you guys were praying really, really hard, well, God had planted that idea in our hearts, in my heart, in Esther's heart, preparing us to and giving that desire to wanting to plant a new church in a new area of London. And that's what's brought us to this point. But friends, that's prayer. That is what being dependent on prayer is. We need to resist the urge to prioritise other things or to squeeze our prayer life into 10 minutes a day and rely on ourselves or self-sufficiency. And I know this because I'm tempted to do the same. And don't get me wrong, look, plans, preparations, people, processes, you know, they all need to happen uh, in church planting. But the irreducible heart of what we need to do is pray. So make it a priority to attend the prayer meeting that they've talked about on Saturday morning, uh, to come to our 2020 Vision prayer meetings, which are once a month. But not just when there's meetings at home, on the school run, on the way to work. Let's make, prior, uh, let's make prayer a priority. But thirdly, to be team orientated. See, Paul wasn't a lone self-appointed maverick, but he was appointed by the church in Antioch and he was sent out with Barnabas in a team. He planted in a team. And we saw in our passage today, uh, 15 verse 40, Paul chose Silas and then he met Timothy in Lystra, 16 verse 1, and then took Timothy with him, 16 verse 3. And Paul didn't just lead teams, but he was willing to be part of a team too. He was a team player. Why? Because church planting is a team game. We've been sent by Grace Church, Worcester Park, and we're working in partnership with you guys, and with Commission, and with FIC. And why is that? Well, it's because we need a team. We can't do it ourselves. We don't have all the gifts that are needed to plant a church. We need a team. We need more team players. People who love the Lord, who want to serve him, and who are up for a challenge. We need musicians, admins, uh, staff, finance uh, people, tech savvy people, uh, evangelists, small group leaders, cross-cultural missionaries, Sunday school teachers. I mean that's uh, a small list. Um, there are many, many other roles and things that we need if this church is going to get off the ground. Because church planting is a team game. But fourthly, spirit driven. So you think, think about it for a second. Think about how small the church was then and how big a task that God had given. How did they know where to go? How did they know not to go to one place, but to go to another? Well, Paul was led by the Holy Spirit. Where not to go, just look, six to, uh, chapter 16, verses 6 to 7, that we have read. <clears throat> Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And then where to go? 16 verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So we see it. 
not Bithynia, but Macedonia. And God's not changed. See, his word is living and active. His spirit is at work today, guiding us. We need to be spirit driven. And we're going to have lots of decisions to make about the church plant in the coming months. What to do now, virtually in lockdown? Where are we going to meet? What is it going to look like? How are we going to launch? Where are we going to launch? Uh, who, you know, decisions about who's going to be doing what. We need to be spirit driven. And if you're considering joining our team, a helpful way to think about it is ability, affinity, opportunity. Ability, could I do it? Affinity, would I do it? Opportunity, should I do it? Now look, the opportunity to serve on the plant is there. The need is there. But as you pray and you think, ask yourself these two questions. Have I got the godly desire to go? And then secondly, have I got the gifts, the time, the energy to contribute? And then speak to David, your pastor, speak to some of the other elders, speak to mature Christian believers who know you really well, and then come and chat to us. We'd love to hear from you. But remember, we need to be spirit driven. And then lastly, and briefly, mission focused. Paul was mission focused seeking to reach unbelievers with the gospel. And there are three different people he comes across in Acts 16 who are ethnically, economically, and spiritually different. And I think we can learn three different approaches that we can apply to our evangelism. Now I'm just gonna to touch on them here. Um, and we're gonna to get to dig much deeper into them next week um, in Adult Sunday School. Uh, you'll hear more of those details a bit later. But let me just go through them briefly. So first approach, Lydia verses 11 to 15, and I'll paraphrase. So she was Asian, a wealthy businesswoman, a God-fearer who showed spiritual interest immediately. And although we're not told, Paul would have most likely reached her through words, showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And that released Lydia from mere religion to gospel Christianity. So the first approach is words, a go and tell approach, telling the gospel to people and showing them how Jesus is the one true God. But the second approach, the slave girl verses 16 to 18, she was probably a native Greek. She was poor, economically exploited and powerless, spiritually devastated, and she ran after Paul in turmoil. What was Paul's approach? Well, it was deeds, miracles and exorcisms to free her from demonic and economic exploitation. So our second approach, a care and serve approach, deed and mercy ministry, not exorcisms and <clears throat> miracles, but caring for others and mercy ministries, which we hope and pray and should pray will lead to conversations about Jesus. So just be thinking where you are, where God has placed you. How could you be serving the community there in Wanstead, particularly during lockdown, during this pandemic, through deed and mercy ministries as a church? The result, while Paul and Silas were stripped, beaten, flogged, imprisoned in verses 19 to 22, and then what happened in God's plan, while well, they met a jail, verses 23. To 34. Roman, blue collar, working class, neither spiritually interested and satisfied like Lydia, but neither spiritually empty and tormented like the slave girl. He was indifferent. Paul's third approach was godly character, Christ like character in community. The jailer was shocked by transformed lives as Paul and Silas prayed and sang songs of praise to God in the midst of being unjustly thrown into prison, verse 25. The jailer experienced kindness in response to his cruelty, verse 28. And Paul and Silas, they had a chance to escape in the earthquake, but what did they do? They stayed put. They showed integrity, Christ-like character in community. And what was the result of that? Well, 
<clears throat> the jailer could not believe that. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul told him the gospel. And not only the jailer, but his whole household was saved. The third approach is the come and see approach. People attracted by our Christ-like character and community. And friends, once the uh, uh, lockdown is over, but even virtually on Zoom, do not underestimate the power of Christ-like community in action. I remember a friend sharing how um, a man from Eastern Europe, uh, he was uh, going to this uh, church uh, social on Friday. So just uh, playing cards, uh, no gospel stuff there, just hanging out, having some food together. But there was something distinct about that community on the Friday that just attracted him. He wanted to know, you're so different to everyone else. You're so kind. You're so generous in making me feel a part of this. And he discovered that it was the gospel that made them this one. And he looked into it and he became a Christian. Friends, that is the power of Christ-like community in action. Paul was mission focused. It resulted in him founding the church in Philippi. So we need to be mission focused. And we need different approaches if we're going to reach different people. How do we church plant? Well, elder led, prayer dependent, team orientated, spirit driven, mission focused. So the question to ponder today and this week will you pray for, support, and or consider joining our planting team. Let me pray and then I'll hand over to Philippe. Father, we thank you for uh, these wonderful um, truths from Acts, just the encouragements uh, that we get, the principles that we're able to uh, understand and then apply today. Lord, we pray that you would uh, work these deep into our hearts uh, to press uh, their implications into our lives, that we may glorify your name. And we pray, Lord, that you'd use this time of uncertainty in this pandemic uh, to really stimulate and to grow your kingdom in ways that we couldn't have imagined uh, were it not the case. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, over to you, Philippe. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rick, for those words, for this encouragement. This always food for thought. That's